Today, it's a pleasure to be joined by a very old friend of mine, Sarah Shears, who is a fantastic executive leadership coach. Sarah, how are you doing? I'm doing really well, Lewis. How are you doing? Very good, thanks. Very good. It's nice to it's nice to have a little window into your living room. What's your office? <laughs> it's my office, my home office. This one. Yeah, it's amazing. So, how you how have you found working from home? I have found it really natural because a lot of the work that I do has been using platforms like this, whether it's Hangout, Skype, whatever, and talking to clients who could be in different parts of the world or you know on different timescales. So for me, it's it's been quite a natural segue. For other people, it hasn't. So for a lot of the people to whom I've been speaking, it's obviously been a little more challenging. But I think you know we're used to this. We're used to modern technology, so it's not an issue. Yeah, no, that's true. So to talking on about leaders, so I've spoken to a lot of people that have been leading businesses, and and much like everyone else, leaders have really been been trying to adjust and adapt to leading in the new normal. Mm. Uh, well, the current COVID era and post COVID era as well, people are going to have to just really adapt. Um, the one big thing that's come out is is empowering your team, um, and that's been a really big theme and trend. Um, yeah. What does it actually mean to empower your team? It means different things to different people, clearly, Lewis, but essentially what it means is further enabling the individual members of your team to perform to their maximum capacity by stretching their abilities, by enabling them to develop and by devolving responsibility to them so that they in turn can take on more of the business and deliver better results for the system as a whole. So yeah. this is something that pre-COVID, there was a shift in culture within organizations to empower teams. And it, as I said, not only does it mean different things to different people, but it's all about this, the makeup of your team. So are your team millennials? Are they um, Gen Z? Because you have to approach these in very different ways. As you know, a lot of senior managers have issues communicating with millennials. They think they've explained something and then the millennial goes off and does something totally different. So clearly there's a gap in that communication. So yeah. as Oh, I hesitate to use the term older, but as maybe more experienced managers, we need to understand how to communicate. And that's about the words we use, the platforms we use, um, ensuring we're getting feedback to make sure that people have understood what we want to do. Uh, and then I think most critically, it's making sure everyone understands the vision for the organization or the system, as we call it. What is it the company is aiming to do? over what period, how do they want to do that? And provided that vision is communicated to the team in a way they can digest and understand and hear, and you've checked that, that is how you start out by first of all, getting everyone on the same page and then giving them tasks and empowering them. Does that make sense? And that, yeah, and why is that important? Do, do you find teams who feel empowered are, are more productive? Absolutely, teams that feel yeah. empowered are more productive because they they take ownership and responsibility. But the way you need to be able to ensure that happens is by getting them to feel passion for the product or the service, the organization in which they work. And if you're talking about younger teams like millennials, like Gen Z, they are much more circumspect about the organizations for which they work. They wanna understand the ethos behind the brand. They wanna understand that the corporation they're part of is one they're proud to be part of that they're green, that they're socially aware, that they're inclusive, they're diverse. And, and I mean, embracing diversity rather than being diverse. And by that, I mean yeah. thought leadership within the team. So there were organizations, as you know, Lewis, who traditionally only hired a specific type of person because that was the person who would succeed. Forget that, that's out the window. Now we want people who are very different, who think differently, who communicate differently, because that's a tremendous value add for the makeup of any team, whether it's middle management, junior management, board level, C-suite, you need to have lots of different ideas and lots of different thinking techniques, because that will make you more powerful. It'll make you um, more inclusive in terms of your customer base, because customers aren't all the same. So that's it's very it. important to get that. What's very, what's often interesting, and, and, and you know this as well as I, is that it's very difficult to hire for that. So you often find people are hiring for experience and skills. And if we're talking about millennials, you're hiring for potential yeah. or for the potential to learn and, and all of those things. So, you know, how can leaders and managers go from, you know, the traditional experience style interview, the competency-based interview to this person could have real potential? 
It's a really good question, Lewis. And I think what they have to do is turn the interview process on the head. I mean, there will be certain things that their candidates need to have, whether it's a language, you can't get around that, or if it's a degree or a knowledge of a certain type of software or whatever. But then rather than create or utilize their existing questionnaire or their interview technique, why not just say to the potential candidate, this is if they've got the time, you know, and it can be done over Skype, right, sell me you. Tell me why yeah. we should hire you. What can, what's your value add for this organization? Now I know some HR leaders may think, oh my goodness, this is you know not what we're used to, but I really believe this is the most exciting time, certainly in my career, We've never been through a period like this. So let's not try and use the same old approach we did before. Let's just throw everything up in the air and see where it lands. Because yeah, what's the yeah. worst thing that can happen? You can always revert to what you did before. But this is an amazing opportunity to embrace something different. It's exciting, Lewis. It, you know, I can almost feel it fizzing with excitement. This is something different. Let, let, let's do this. I'm so excited about the post-COVID era, but it's interesting on, on, on interviewing. I mean, you know what it's been like, it's like, you know, interviewing twos, you know, we need to be fair. You have a scorecard, you can mark people. Um, and so it almost goes against just saying, Hey, like, why should, why should we hire you? Or why do you want to come work here? Or cause a lot of the time, you know, millennials, they answer, well, why should I? Why should I come work here? What have you got to offer me? What will my yeah. career be better here than where I am? So it's, it's, it's yeah, it's so a very interesting. Dynamic. You need to be able to um, message your passion, Lewis. If you work, for instance, in a software company, I'll talk software because you and I are familiar with software, but it applies in any organisation. If you're the hiring manager, you are more senior than the person uh, you're going to hire. Usually, uh, usually, or at least appear. What is it that excites you about working for that organisation? And of course, that may throw up questions. Maybe you're not excited anymore, in which case, possibly that's something you need to review. But essentially, yeah. there will be. You will have joined an organization because of the product, the service, the opportunity, or the hiring manager. That's why people join companies. They've got a mate there who says, it's great here. You know, there's a lot of space for you to innovate, or they do free food at lunchtime, certainly with a lot of American software companies. You know, there's something there. And I know I wasn't being facetious, but you can build out with that. But if the person who's doing the interview, who's the front, the first touch, isn't passionate, then you are going to lose a lot of a lot of potential. And when you 100%. talk to millennials, as you say, it's more about what can you offer me. But I think we need to readdress that balance a little bit. Yes, we need to be able to offer them development. That's what millennials want. They want development and potential. Of course, they want money, but they're not quite as money driven as previous generations have been. They're about how can we contribute to the planet? How can we save the natural resources? What are you doing as an organization? So use your green credentials when you're talking to these people. Open it up and say, we're very open to anyone who can come up with a suggestion where we can minimize our carbon footprint. That's why we don't do a lot of travel in Europe or whatever, whatever. You know, there are lots of ways of positioning your organization. These are some successes we've had. So treat that candidate as you would a client. So when you go to a client, you understand their pain, don't you? What you're doing is you're going in there and you're saying, okay, what are the challenges for my client? They need to do X, Y, and Z. How can what I'm doing help them? If you take that perspective when you're talking to potential individuals you want to bring into the organization, what are the pain points of that candidate? What's going to make them choose you over someone else? And that, that's where your experience has to come in. But you can actually yeah. ask them. You know, it's not a yeah. dark art. You can say to them, what are you looking for in the next 18 months, two years? Where do you want to be in five years? Here's how we can help you make that transition. Yeah. And we have yeah. to take away some of the taboos when we hire people. You're not hiring people forever. You may only hire someone for 18 months, maybe even a year. That's okay, because it's good for both of you. You give them a learning opportunity, they give you their energy, their vision, their difference, and then they go on to somewhere else. And we need to kind of take a different view of that. Like, frankly, okay. when we're talking about teams and empowering people, we need to take a different view about failure. I mean, that's a really horrible word. But I'll tell you what we're Well, when teams are have responsibility to devolve to them, some of them don't want it because they're afraid to fail. And what we need to do is get this word out into the open and say, if you're not failing at something, you're not being creative enough. You're not trying hard enough. You don't achieve 
something exponentially different without failing. Think about drug therapy. How many times did they fail? It wasn't a failure. Yeah. It was they didn't get the exact perfect answer. So we need to destigmatize failure. We need to encourage people to make mistakes. That's definitely part of default responsibility. So alongside passion, alongside communication, we need to say it's okay if you don't get it right the first time. Nobody gets everything right the first time. And what do you learn from being successful? It feels good, but what do you learn from failure? You learn what not to do again. So for me, an organization that embraces a culture that says failure is part of success, that, that's a really good environment in which to work. 100%. One of the big lessons I've learned from running my business for 10 years is you've got to be comfortable with losing. Yeah. You know, everyone, everyone loses. It's cool to lose. Yeah. Um, so, so often you're brought up saying, you know, losing's, losing's bad. It's got negative connotations. But for me, you either you win or you learn. And, 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 and the fear of failure often stops you trying new things. You're right. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing and you need to be very comfortable with it. Yeah. And I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. everyone runs their business into the wall. So, you know, please don't think that. But when you've got teams, you, you break your organization down into teams. And what you need to identify is what do those individual team members want? Because that's very important in terms of empowering. Because we've come again from your thing where success is everything great. I, I need to get that position. I need that one to be successful. Some yeah. people are very happy not moving to the next stage. They found their groove. They're very good at it. You know, they underpin a lot of other parts of the team. So understanding the roles within your team and what the individuals want within that is also very important. And communicating to them that that, that is not only acceptable, but that delights the organization is also very important. So, so, that's, so you've got the essentially attracting people to a company by... Um, by the green credentials, by listening to what they're hoping to achieve and so forth. Once they're in, so empowering them properly means respecting them, listening to them and understanding where, where they're at in their life and, and what they want out of work. It is. And it's about not just listening to them, but where they come up with an idea, it's about acting on that idea, showing them or allowing them to act on it. If that's a possibility, I mean, if they're right through the door, maybe they haven't established enough of a, an internal ecosystem, but it's making each team member aware that they are important, that their role is important to the overall vision of the organization and that the company is not this faceless organization. The company is each one of those teams and each one of those team members, and they have a vital role to play in the future growth and development of the organization. And by yeah. doing that and by being open and communicative and continually communicative, then you will, you'll acquire their loyalty, their interest, their emotional investment, and they will give more because they see that for everything they give, there is a result. So yeah. that's very important in empowering your team and checking back with them, making sure they understand what it is you've agreed and are they happy and have things changed and, you know, what, what else would they like? Mentor them, develop them, stretch them, ask them what skills they're looking to gain and then either put in place the training or a buddy scheme or a mentorship program. And the mentorship program, as you know, works not just for the team members and empowering them, but senior managers too. It gives them an opportunity to share all of the experience they've gathered, which frankly is like gold, whether it's within that organization or another. You know, they can share their life stories. They can talk about things that have worked for them, things that haven't. Because I'm sure for you, Lewis, like me and lots of other people, you've learned amazing little nuggets that you acquire through listening to someone tell a story. Well, you know, also the other thing is often people, people you learn more about working with a great leader or manager than actually the job itself often, especially earlier on in your career. If yeah. you're lucky enough to find an amazing, inspiring leader, and, and you and you attach yourself to them and, and you yeah. just learn so much yeah um, and it's often under under talked about underestimated but hugely valuable yeah and that that can lead us into another area but that's where i think people who've mm. recently retired from business they have an opportunity to come back as like a senior buddy to share all their experience because what these people leave and then we lose that massive body of resource that's for another yeah. time that's very true. <laughs> it's very true. now 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 we've moved on to the I mean, we're, we're submersed in work from home now. And so a lot of these great initiatives that you've talked about, you know, a lot of good companies do um, and others are trying to do, which is great. It's an interesting challenge now having doing it virtually where you might be a leader running 
I don't know, a meeting of 50 people, half of them have their video cameras off because you can't force them to have their video cameras on. Yeah. And, and trying to engage with your team now, it's, it's a fascinating time and experience. And, um, you know, people are learning to do it quickly. And, and again, it's, uh, it's trial and error, back to, you know, a fear of, uh, fear of failure or, or losing it things. I think this is, everyone's just trying to, to do different things now. Mm. But I think we're all in it together. And, and that is yeah. greatly comforting because if we weren't, it would throw up different issues. But everybody knows that most people are trying their absolute best to get through this the best way they can. And I have no doubt this will change the way we behave and interact for some considerable time, if not, you know, forever. But forever is a long time. I think invite feedback. If you, 50 people is a lot to have on one call. You know, ideally you don't want 50 people. If you're a C-suite or whatever, you'll probably have 15 or 12 or whatever. Breaking it down into smaller groups, if you can, is a much easier way of ensuring that everybody feels part of it, everyone feels included. You know, having some kind of agenda that uh, gives you a framework, but then you have the flexibility to go organically where the conversation goes, you know, like, like you and me, yeah. it's also very important. But if you solicit feedback after one of those meetings, you know, just a very quick email, a group email, anyone got any ideas? What could we have done better? Because then people feel you're listening to them. So I think that's even more important now. That's true. There's also now we've we've seemed to have ridden the tide of everyone's getting quite tired of, of the Zoom calls and the, the constant videos because it's great to start with. And everyone felt like they needed to engage regularly with their team. Yeah. And now it's a bit of fatigue, you know, yeah. and I think it's okay for people to not go on some of these calls. I mean, we're, we're seeing like, you know, the daily meetings, the quizzes, the part, the virtual pubs, the virtual coffees. So we're getting a little bit fatigued, I think now with all of these things. So again, just, just appreciating that everyone's in a slightly different scenario or a yeah, different mental state often. And it's okay to, to dip in and out of these things, I think is useful as well. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think there's nothing wrong with establishing a target date for face to face now. I mean, we hear that the Prime no. Minister is going to let us know on Sunday about a loosening of some of the restrictions. It's likely that we won't be doing the kind of normal meetings we did until the very end of the year. There's nothing wrong now with arranging, you know, November, December time meetings or whatever. You can always change them. But then we've got something in the diary that says, do you know what? This is going to be back to normal or more normal then. And that gives us something to aim for because humans like to have a target. They like a framework. We all do. So, you know, I'm already putting in loads of meetings for pre-Christmas drinks and catch-ups and how are you and who's and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. With yeah. clients, and, you know, and colleagues. Yeah, yeah. And so on. I think yeah. it's important that we have um, a mechanism in place to enable us to exit this, which the government will provide, but that also in our head, we're not afraid to, to re-enter a social milieu and, and say, okay, now we're gonna, we may not shake hands, we may wear a face covering, but we're gonna get back to normal because humans are very social creatures. And I think yeah, yeah, whilst as you say, there was tremendous novelty and interest in doing what we're doing, whether it's whatever the platform is, we need human contact. You know what John Don said yeah. about no man is an island. So I think that's that absolutely, and it's important to start getting people's minds back to because the whole dialogue has been stay at home, save lives, yeah. Yeah. and and if you're doing a job where you're not out, you know, if you're not working for the NHS, if you're not a builder, if you're not a cleaner, security guard, most of the time you're at home and you're probably quite scared to get out. And, and so now it's the time just to start to let people know that, you know, soon it's going to be okay. And then we're going to put measures in place to make sure you're safe. Mm. If, and when you come back to work, it might be a day a week from the office, two days a week, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how this all develops over the next six months or so. Yeah. Very interesting. Especially the traveling to and from the commuting seems to me to be one of the most challenging areas as, as we move forward. And I think yeah. we're going to see a lot of those so-called fashion masks, you know, that, that came in. I think certainly I'm I'm prepared. I've got some. So, yeah, <laughs> I think but I've got my mask. Idea. And literally culturally in Asia, you see them and they've been used a lot and always used a lot here. Not not so much. And I think you're yeah. right. We'll start to see them used more. I, I think it's a very sensible precaution because not only does it send a physical reminder of, of you know we need to be careful but there is there is some proof that a, a piece of material across your face will inhibit the transmission of virus so i think it's all good but 
you know, coming back to, to what we were talking about, I think we have reached a point now where there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and yeah. we can see it approaching. And so long as it isn't a train, that's all good news. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining me and sharing your thoughts. Great. And uh, speak you. soon. Thanks oh, a lot. Too.